Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Blog. And yes, I know before you comment, there's a new trailer coming tomorrow. I know. It's at 6 a.m. my time in uh, California here, and I will definitely wake up and record my reaction to it and post it right before I leave for work. I have to leave for work just a couple hours after the trailer drops, so hopefully it drops on time and everything goes accordingly and planned well, and uh, I'll do my best to get it up to you guys. And then the breakdown video will do, you know, I'll come home from work and I'll work on it and try to get it out to you guys uh, tomorrow night or Wednesday morning. Um, and then also make sure you leave comments in that video and I will definitely make a whole video where I respond to your comments like we do with every trailer. So today what I want to talk about and what we're going to talk about for the next few videos, I'm going to try to pump them out real quick here, is some of the interviews and panels and things that happened at San Diego Comic Con that we didn't cover, some information that I could go into a little bit more depth on. And so we're going to break one, you know, each video is going to focus on a different interview or place where uh, the actors and director Ruben Fleischer talked at Comic Con. So today is going to be about the San Diego Comic Con panel itself. And there's a video I did watch where I got to see the panel and I'll put a link to it down below. It doesn't have the footage, so everyone out there is like, oh, it doesn't have the footage. It does not have the footage, obviously, um, but we're getting the trailer tomorrow, so it's all good. We're going to be fine. And I know, like I said, some people were asking me already, is the trailer going to have the same thing you saw at Comic-Con? And obviously the answer is no. It's only been a week. They couldn't finish all of those visual effects, and some of those scenes they showed were like, Oh, you know, not complete scenes, but more than you would see in a trailer in one cut, obviously. And so, uh, I, like I said in that video, we're going to get a version of what we saw at Comic-Con, plus some additional footage, most likely. So be on the lookout for that tomorrow. Uh, but as far as what was gone over in this, Ruben Fleischer said, um, he said Tom wanted the role. And when he heard Tom was interested in the role, it got him more excited to be involved because he was already on as a director and was, you know, they were looking at cast and stuff and he wanted Tom Hardy. And then when he found out Tom Hardy was a fan of the character that made him just, you know, elevated him big time, but also made him realize the kind of responsibility he has because he is a big fan of Tom Hardy and he likes every movie Tom Hardy has been in. And so he was like, I don't want to make the bad Tom Hardy movie. He's like, so it really put a lot of pressure on me. But we also, at the end of the day, talked about the character, what we want to do with it, and we looked at our limitations and we try to work around those limitations and still deliver a good movie at the end of the day. Um, and something that's true to the tone and the character of Venom without getting into, you know, obviously the Spider-Man stuff. So, you know, he talked about doing the best they could. And I, I like that they at least mentioned that. They're like, hey, look, we have limitations. We had things we couldn't do but we still tried our best. And at the end of the day, Ruben Fleischer did say he was proud of this movie and that he's very proud of the progress as they're going through editing. And he's really, you know, he was excited to show people the footage that they showed off at Comic-Con at this panel. And he was so excited. And when he saw a good reaction to it, it made him feel even better. And he was like, all right, we're moving in the right direction. Everyone here really liked what they saw. The last trailer got 64 million plus views in like two days, three days. He's like, so I think we're on the right path and I'm gonna keep moving forward. So they talked more about that. Um, Tom Hardy did mention that, uh, uh, he gravitated to Venom's look. That was what kind of drew him to the project originally, and his son was a big fan. And he said, you know, I wanted to make a movie that my son could maybe watch, but as we were developing this movie and making it and filming it, uh, I realized obviously it's going to be an R-rated movie, most likely, even though they haven't got the official rating yet. And he said, uh, so my son probably won't be able to see this. <laughs> so it looks like he might not let his son see rated R movies. He did mention that, uh, he goes, I do a lot of movies and in them my son can't watch a lot of them because I'm violent or I'm swearing and I don't really want him to see me like that. So I thought, oh, maybe we'll do this superhero movie. And then he's like, as we got deeper into the project, I was like, oh yeah, I'm biting dudes heads off in this movie. So I don't know if my son will be able to watch it. He goes, so that plan didn't work out. He goes, but I had good intentions uh, when I you know, took this project on. I wanted to do something for my son. And so hopefully maybe he'll still let his son see it. Uh, you know, I saw rated R movies when I was 10. It wasn't a big deal. So hopefully, you know, his son will get on board with this. And since his son's a Venom fan, I have a feeling Tom will let him see it. Um, so then he also mentioned uh, the script, that he really loved the script and he liked the character most of all. And he kind of extrapolated a lot of things from the script that he wanted to do in a role. And he remembered when he was on the movie Legend and he mentions that, how he played two brothers, like two characters. And he said, you know, this time I get to do that again, but it's me and me, you know, like not like me and a brother with different personalities. He's like, it's me and then like this symbiote, but I'm talking to it. It has my, you know, I do the voice of it and it's kind of us going back and forth. And he goes, and I like that duality and I have only got to do it once before in a movie. And this time I get to do it on a completely different level with a budget, you know, and special effects and visual effects and everything. So that got him really excited and that's why he wanted to uh, come, you know, be part of this role. And then he also gave a shout out to um, to the sound guys, uh, Patrick Anderson, who is the sound playback guy, and Michael Koff, who they call Coffee on the set. And, uh, and then he said that those two guys were playing the audio back into a piece 
in his in uh, Tom Hardy's ear. So when he was speaking as Eddie Brock, he could hear the Venom voice coming back at him. So essentially, these two sound guys were playing Venom on set. So that way, you know, Eddie could hear uh, the dialogue coming back and forth, and it would come across more natural as he talked to himself. Um, so and they gave him like you know timing reactions and stuff. So I thought that was cool that he gave a shout out to those guys, and he also mentioned a uh, name. Uh, Mr. Franklin, who I looked up on IMDb as Paul J. Franklin, who's the visual effects supervisor, he gave a shout out to him saying that Patrick was the one in charge of creating the look of Venom, and essentially, like he's one of the overall people looking at the look of Venom. So he gave uh, Patrick Franklin a shout out as well, or Paul J. Franklin a shout out as well. So that was cool just to get a little peek behind the curtains and some of the people that are making this movie um, outside of Tom and, you know, and Ruben and, uh, and Riz Ahmed who were there on the panel, but it was cool that they gave a shout out to these guys and their hard work that they've done to bring this character to life. They also mentioned the lethal protector thing, you know, uh, uh, Jessica Chabot, uh, who is from uh, Nerdist, she was doing the uh, kind of moderating the panel. I think she also moderated the previous panel, which is the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So she was up there asking these questions and asked about what books these were inspired off of. And Ruben Fleischer said lethal protector was kind of their main thing and they wanted to follow Eddie's journey in that. And even though Spider-Man was in that story, it was mostly an Eddie journey. And it was him trying to protect these homeless people and people that were like down on their luck and trying to fight back for the common person in a way. Uh, but also to find redemption in himself. And that's kind of the journey they said they wanted to mirror and the tone they wanted because there was some humor in it. You know, the scene where Eddie pats the lady on the head and stuff. Uh, you know, there was all that stuff and they wanted to, you know, put that in the film and they wanted it to have a, like a nice balance between darkness and humor uh, to kind of get you through the story because that's what got them through reading Lethal Protector and that was their takeaway was that balance. So I thought that was great that they mentioned that and that you know, they have, when they look at their limitations, they're like, well, the one thing we can get right is tone and purpose of character. And so that's what they're trying to do uh, with this story and with this movie. And, you know, Tom did go on to say that Eddie is a bit of a loser. He's had a falling out with his girlfriend, Ann Wang. So they're not married. He Ed does mention that they're not married yet, but that she is his ex-girlfriend. So it looks like they were close, maybe close to getting married. And then something bad happened. Uh, they did talk about Michelle Williams having a, a really decent sized role in this movie and being more than just the girl girlfriend or whatever, uh, that they're trying to do more things with her and that she's a tremendous actress that they all loved. And even uh, Ruben Fleischer mentioned that he was a PA on uh, Dawson's Creek. And so even though he never met Michelle Williams way back then, uh, 20 years ago, he said, I was a PA on it. That was one of my first Hollywood jobs. And I, I think they filmed that in the Carolinas somewhere. I can't remember. Uh, but he said that was kind of where he began as a PA. And then now 20 years later, he gets to cast her in this movie. Uh, he thought that was really cool to go full circle and, uh, and to see her career grow all these years he knew she was right for this role. And so that was cool that they gave her a shout out, even though she couldn't be there. Um, they definitely both gave her, Ruben and, uh, and Tom gave her a big shout out. Um, and so, yeah, so he says he's kind of a loser and Eddie's on hard times. And so he's trying to build himself back up, but he has questionable morals. And he's, does, he has a moral code, but he, he's willing to wiggle around and take shortcuts in order to get what he wants. Um, and, uh, and so that makes him kind of unlikable at times. And they talked about that, how they didn't want him to just be a full on good guy. And, but, his question, his morals get put into even more question when he meets the symbiote, because now the symbiote is willing to kill and maim and tear people apart. And Eddie's like, look, I'm willing to lie and cheat to get things, but you're really stepping it up. And then they talk about the seduction of that and how that does, you know, kind of turn Eddie a little bit. And that was some of the footage that was shown was there was a scene where Eddie is liking the new him and, uh, and Anne is kind of not liking it and she's afraid of that. And so they talk about that a little bit and they obviously they showed that footage in the panel. Um, but so that, that to me was interesting that they're going that route with it where Eddie's like, yeah, look, I'll lie and cheat, but killing and, and murdering and, you know, to get what I want. Uh, I don't know if I'm a, in on board with that, but then I guess he does become on board with that. So you'll get to see the, you know, deconstruction of a guy who's trying to redeem himself. And maybe that's what Ruben Fleischer said when, you know, meant when he said, there's not really any heroes in this movie. It's just a lot of people who live in the gray. And that's what separates this movie from some of the other superhero movies out there that he's, you know, seen. And, and, and mostly he was talking about the Marvel movies. Um, Cause obviously we know there's been Blade and there's been, you know, like other, you know, DC movies too, with that kind of walk that gray area. But he was more referring to the Marvel movies that are out there right now and that are so popular and how this kind of stands out from those. And that was his goal was he wanted to do something that would turn heads and make people go, oh, that's different, even though it's not really that different, but it's just different for what's mainstream right now, for the most part, or what's being accepted in the mainstream right now. Um, so uh, then Riz went on to say that, you know, uh, 
his character, he talked about Carlton Drake and how Carlton Drake doesn't see himself as the bad guy. Most bad guys don't see themselves as a bad guy, uh, which is true. And that's how you play good bad guys is that you, you think you're doing the right thing and you kind of convince yourself of it. So even Riz says, you know, I'm still convinced my guy, you know, Carlton Drake is in the right, even after filming this movie. Um, he goes, but Carlton Drake looks at mankind and he says, look at what we're doing to ourselves. We're, we're destroying ourselves. We're destroying our planet. And we, we need to be better than that. And so, Carlton Drake's mission in this is to, you know, kind of evolve humanity in a way, not just physically, but also the way they think. Uh, but he sees that uh, humanity is destroying Earth, you know, in, in a roundabout way. And he thinks that our future rests in space. And that's what caused him to go looking into space with his life foundation on these secret projects. And then he kind of cuts himself short there because he says, you know, what? while we go research space, that's how we come across the symbiotes. And then he's like, oh crap. And he goes, you know what? I'm not going to say any more. So again, our theory of like way back when we made that video of the pictures taken at the life foundation that we found on Twitter, um, they showed like little models of uh, shuttles leaving Earth and they showed like a robot on a planet and it was like scavenging for something. I'm thinking that they find the symbiotes and then maybe bringing the symbiotes back to Earth, th this shuttle gets knocked off course because maybe one of the symbiotes escapes and that causes the ship to crash. Uh, that's just a theory of mine, but it looks like there's a little bit more evidence that might support that theory. So if so, that's pretty cool. But if it's something different, I'm okay with that too. But uh, it was cool that he let that little bit sneak out. Um, and then he also mentions the original story in the comics and how Carlton Drake and his board of his committee board of Life Foundation were kind of a direct response to the Cold War and how everyone on that board thought the nuclear war was coming and that everything would get wiped out. So they were a bunch of like one percenters trying to create a safe haven for themselves, a club where they can exist underground. And while the nuclear fallout was happening on Earth, they would have some kind of guardians protecting them, kind of like the plot of Resident Evil, the final chapter, which I said in previous videos. So he mentions that was kind of the thing in the comic, but they wanted to update that. So he, he said when he was reading the script, he liked the spirit of the character and how it touched on that kind of way of thinking, but in a more modern age, because obviously we're not scared of the Cold War so much anymore. Now we're more concerned about the planet in general and how like ozone's ripping apart and, you know, a, a global warming and all these things. And that's kind of Carlton Drake's headspace is that the world is on its last legs. And so we need to find a way to go beyond the earth and what out there could help us exist. And so it's not just about getting symbiotes to get superpowers, but bonding with them so that we could maybe exist out in space until we find a new habitable planet or something. So it's kind of, those are the kind of the wheels he's working with. And I thought that was pretty neat that he thinks that much about his character and maybe we'll see some of the, cause obviously a lot of times when actors play characters, not everything they talk about as motivation ends up on screen, but I'm hoping there's another on screen for us to understand at least the character and his point of view and maybe have even some people go oh okay I could kind of see that even though he's going about it the wrong way and he's kind of as he says breaking a few eggs to make an omelet uh, he thinks the omelet is the most important part and the eggs are you know not so important in his overall plan and the last thing, you know, Ruben Fleischer was mentioning about Riot and that he's Venom's main adversary in this film. I know a lot of people are kind of against that. They're like, oh, that's not true to the comics. Why didn't they pick Scream? And even I was kind of wondering about Scream um, because she's the most known, I feel like, amongst comic fans. But I feel like when they were coming up with this movie, they they actually talk about, and we'll talk about in the next episode, um, a little bit of a backstory uh, to these characters and so uh, to Venom and Riot. And we'll talk about that in, a, in another video because they don't really mention it here on this panel. They mention it in the next interview. Um, but there there's a story reason for it. Uh, they were like, you know, out of the five, you know, I guess they could have also picked Lasher if they wanted to pick Lasher. Um, but uh, you know, but they felt if they changed it, you know even though they don't say this in so many words, obviously in the panel, because you'll see it for yourself, I'm inferring a lot here, but they, there is a story reason for why it's Riot over the other five. And when they looked at Riot, there was more of a clean slate there and a, you know more ambiguous of what his motivations were, what his powers were for the most part in the books. So they were like, well, he's bigger vi you know, visually than Venom. Uh, so let's build off that. And so you know they were like, all right, we have a, vi a villain who's kind of bigger than Venom. We're going to give him abilities that Venom doesn't have, and uh, and we're going to kind of play with that. And so there's a reason kind of why Riot is chosen to be the villain, but they did hint that you will probably see other symbiotes in this movie and definitely setups for other symbiotes in future movies. So I don't doubt that we're going to get the other characters, um, maybe even just briefly, or maybe there'll be science experiments that like fail and get burned up or die or something. But I have a feeling we're going to see other symbiotes, and they definitely hint at other symbiotes. So it's not going to just be Riot, uh, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see 
what else they do and what they show us in the trailer tomorrow because we did see at the comic-con footage the spikes coming out of like one of the ladies backs and i couldn't really get a see like see well who the actress was but i'm hoping it was donna diego um in it and so hopefully we still will get scream and i think visually she would be a good one to have so i don't doubt we'll see her in the film um but if we don't you know that would be a surprise to me uh but i'm thinking we might but she's just not the main villain and they said there's a story reason for that and then they also went on to say that eddie brock his kind of adversary in the film in a way is Anne weighing like he has venom is has a backstory to riot and Ruben Fleischer compares Eddie's backstory to Anne in a similar way to Venom's backstory to Riot. So I don't know if Riot and Venom are actual like brothers or siblings somehow or father and son or I don't know if there's some kind of connection. Maybe they were, you know, when they were captured together, maybe they developed a relationship on the space shuttle heading back to Earth. Maybe they developed a hatred for each other. Um, so th he did mention that there's something there. And again, we'll talk about it more in another episode, but they, they touch on it very briefly here in this way by saying that there's a connection to Eddie and the, or Venom and the symbiote uh, of Riot. There's a connection there. But then Eddie also has this past with Anne and the two kind of relationships not really mirror each other, but it shows that these two characters are going on similar journeys both Venom symbiote and Eddie Brock and I thought that was very interesting that they put that kind of thought into this but also showing that that the suit itself has a motivation it has a reason for doing things and it, it and it has a, a new purpose now that it's here on earth and that purpose kind of coincides with what Eddie overall wants to do so seeing that they're putting that much thought into it makes me feel like hopefully we're at least going to get a good story and i know it's not going to be 100 percent accurate to the comic books and i know people want that and they want spider-man they want all these other things but if we can just remove ourselves from that knowing we're not going to get that now and maybe still give this a chance these people definitely seem like they're working hard on it and uh, and i i feel like they're trying their best and who knows their best may not be something we all like but i would rather wait till the movie comes out to judge that for myself uh, for me I think a lot of the things that are here are interesting and I liked seeing that much thought put into a project like this when there were days where movies didn't have this much thought put into it. I mean, I keep thinking about things like Jonah Hex where they were like, oh, just give him like supernatural powers and even though that's a, a version of Jonah Hex from one of the comics, it's not the one most people know and I would have rather seen, you know, a different angle done with that. Uh, and so, you know, you take these characters, I remember when Blade came out, they kind of took the core of what Blade was and they they kind of changed it a bit and they were like all right we got to modernize it we got to change some of the origin we got to change some of the background we're going to you know change deacon frost to be a different kind of villain and there was a lot of changes to it and i would say if blade was made nowadays and those changes were announced people would react negatively they would be like oh well that's not the, the comic and where's dracula and where's all you know like we we want all the things we know and he's got to team up with ghost rider and he's got to be part of the midnight suns and there would be people coming at you with all these different opinions based on the era of the comic they grew up with and I would say Blade would probably get a lot of hate today uh, for being made the way it was. And that's why I kind of use Blade as my my measuring tool for this movie and why I try to refrain myself from getting too bent out over, you know, over the changes that are being made uh, because, you know, they made changes to Blade and that worked out fine. And I'm hoping things like that work out for this movie. But again, I'm just being optimistic and maybe I'm being unreal unrealistic with that comparison. So if you don't think this is a good comparison to Blade, that's fine. You know, let me know in the comments below. Uh, but but that's pretty much what I want to say and then everything they went over in this panel uh, that's you know obviously they talked about spider-man stuff at the end uh, because people can't help themselves almost every interviewer mentioned the spider-man thing and it was it really got on my nerves because obviously these guys can't directly answer that and they're in a it puts them in a weird position where they're like look we would love for that one day I'm sure the people at Sony would love for spider-man and venom to meet but these are the limitations we had we had to make a venom movie and uh, well, we didn't have to, but we got offered it. I looked into the project. I kind of liked it. I wanted Tom Hardy. He wanted to be a part of it. And then it was just like a snowball effect. And then at the end of the day, he's like, I'm really proud of what we did. And we worked really hard to do the best version of Venom we could considering the limitations. And I think that's admirable. And I think that's more than a lot of filmmakers would do um, in, in, this, in this situation and in these people's shoes. So I'm glad they put this much work into it. And I hope it pays off. And I hope this trailer tomorrow blows our minds. So let me know what you think of all this down below and make sure you check out the panel itself at the link down below so you can see everything that they said without me paraphrasing stuff and inferring my own opinion on stuff. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I'll see you in the future. Peace.